So we are going to start with Joyce. Um, <clears throat> and I thought that I yesterday was Fed Action Day in, in the United States. Um, we, all market participants were watching not only for the action where they did not change Fed funds, um, but they also we were looking for uh, what they had to say about the future, uh, as well as maybe some of the guidance, as well as maybe even some of the job owning uh, that we heard from the Fed chairman. And I thought maybe we would turn it over to Joyce and say, Joyce, when you think about the world, uh, where do you see the, the, the U.S. economy in particular? Um, and what do you think of the moving parts uh, behind it? So what's your, Joyce, what is your initial observation of the world's economy and maybe where the U.S. fits in that? Um, and then also, wh what do you think of the big moving parts moving forward? So we'll start with you, Joyce. Thank you so much, Tom, and wonderful to be with the Foreign Policy Association and with you and Mark, whose views I respect so much. Well, let me just start by saying this is going to be remembered as the year of U.S. exceptionalism. Now, there's a cost to that that I'm going to talk about, and I am actually one of the few that is not in the soft landing camp at this stage, but U.S. exceptionalism really ruled the day. So, you know, more than 500 basis points of Fed tightening, and you still have, if you take a look at the growth numbers, I mean, we're looking at 3.5% real GDP growth, um, you know, very strong productivity gains. And who would have thought, given where we were during the pandemic, that you would still have an unemployment rate below 4%, closer to 3.5%. So it has been a year of um, U.S. exceptionalism, which is really in contrast to the rest of the world because we've seen the disappointment with China's reopening. We've also seen um, in Europe, particularly more bearishness on um, Germany that's playing out and how the European economy wilted after 400 basis points of rate hikes by the ECB. So I, I think where are we now in the world that we've had this sort of US exceptional year? Well, let me just talk about the rising cost of US exceptionalism. So. Um, if you account for the student loan um, forgiveness, in the U.S., you've now had an 8% of GDP deficit, which we haven't seen since World War II and the global financial crisis. And now I think we are moving into a narrative that is less focused on the recession risk, and it has turned to the higher term premium and also the, the higher rates and the higher for longer um, you know, risk that I think lies ahead. And this is why we're not in the soft landing camp, because if you ask me the question, can you reduce inflation below 3% while keeping unemployment below 4%, it's possible, but it's not probable. So we have a soft landing scenario at about um, you know, 40%. I know that has become everybody else's base case. I don't see a hard landing, but I do see a mild recession. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, soft landing because there's a whole range of definitions for soft landing. Some people talk about no landing as a soft landing. Some people talk about the mild recession um, as a soft landing um, as well. But in every soft landing that has occurred since the 1960s, and there have been three, you've basically had um, the Fed begin to ease in less than six months. And this is where I think it's going to be more tricky because getting inflation to 3% was possible. Getting it back to 2% I think is very difficult. And I do think we're in a regime where it is going to be higher for longer. And when we look at the inflationary pressures in the U.S., um, it's really the services side that stands out. Um, and it is that I think the inflation psychology is shifting. Um, looking at the demographics, also the labor force conditions, we do think that some of these wage um, pressures are going to stay with us. You know, on top of that, you know, we didn't have the housing downturn that we had expected, and rent inflation remains elevated as well. So even though we have seen a Fed pause, I don't think you're going to get cuts um, that immediately. Um, we see slowing in the U.S. economy, but um, you know, um, and, and something that could look more like a mild recession, you know, at a pr more precarious time as we get towards the 2024 elections in the second half of the year. But this year, it was um, a true year of um, U.S. exceptionalism that ruled the day. And I think that um, the cost of that is actually becoming clearer, though, when we look at the U.S. debt ratios and the U.S. fiscal 
trajectory. And we see, we're seeing that play out in the treasury market over the past month. Um, you know, we had, and this rarely happens, you know, you know, the treasury funding needs versus JP Morgan's estimates, there was a differential that was $260 billion. This is not a small variation. The U.S. deficit, I think, has come into full focus. Well, Joyce, th thank you very much uh, for that. Let's unpack that a little bit. And you mentioned that the degree of difficulty uh, of of navigating a potential soft landing, and he talked about unemployment. Um, I'll tell you, what, my firm uh, studies the credit card industry in the United States, which I think are some of the best consumer lenders in the market, and they they are guiding their research analysts to think of unemployment between four and a half and five percent, uh, which is different than where it is today. Uh, how do you how do you observe the current employment market, unemployment rate? And, and what do you think of the forces that may drive it uh, in the future? So I, I think that one thing we have to look at is that it is, again, going back to the services sector, where we have really had um, you know, a deficit of, you know, uh, as, as far as filling the labor market conditions, has been in many of these services sector, many in the um, you know, lower end jobs where um, you know, Im immigration policy is part of it, but demographics are also a large part of this, that you've had the workforce over 55 leaving the workforce. So I think that you are going to continue to see you know, shortages of labor you know, in certain sectors um, on the services side persist. Um, and that's a function of demographics. It's a, it's a um, function of, um, you know, w wage pressures that will also, um, you know, continue. Um, and, and it's also policy, it's structural, it's immigration policy, you know, as well. So I, I feel like a lot of people have said 5% unemployment, but they keep on rolling this out. And when we look at the um, data numbers that have come out on labor force participation, when I look at J.P. Morgan's own forecast, that's where I'm most skeptical. Will we really get to close to a 5% unemployment by the third quarter of next year? And this comes back to the reasons why I don't think that you're necessarily get inflation you know, so much below 3%, that you may be stuck here. Central banks won't change their target, but they're also not going to be able to cut rates um, as easily. So, you know, when um, we uh, take a look at the um, conditions, um, you know, in the labor market, you know, I was recently speaking with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they said they had only one member that was even cutting back the labor force right now. But there's real concerns that you won't be able to rehire. And so that services demand has been a big piece of the story, even though we've seen goods inflation coming down. Okay, terrific. And then um, it, just globally, Thinking about Europe, maybe the European and the Asia region, and we're going to really dig in on the Asia region in the next panel, but I think it'd be really valuable to hear Joyce maybe set the stage for us a little bit. Um, you, you talked about growth and economic forces in the U.S. just now, but how would you just from a broad perspective speak about Europe and then speak about Asia? So, um, you know, so Tom, one exercise we did was we redid our – sensitivities to its spillover effect. And let me go back to U.S. exceptionalism again. We estimate that every 1% decline in U.S. growth takes about 0.7% off of global growth. But if you look at a 1% decline in China's growth, we now think that only takes 0.2% off of global growth because we actually have seen quite a bit of supply chain relocation. And a 1% slowdown in Europe takes only 0.3% off of global growth. So a lot of this U.S. exceptionalism story and the financial markets performance, because it's a dollar market, you know, has been because um, you know, we do see that um, you know, the, this U.S. exceptionalism has ruled the day when you look at the growth spillover and also the financial market spillover. But looking at um, just the trends in the rest of the world, um, we have seen that in China, you know, structurally bearish trades are really taking hold. And you can really see that in the portfolio outflows um, from China. We've taken China down to 4.8% growth this year, 4.2% next year. That's still you know, well above the developed countries, but it's below their own target. And in Europe, we are seeing just um, more concerns about the slowdown there, but also particularly looking at Germany, because a lot of their export model was very dependent on China. 
So, um, you know, so, so I, I, I think that um, next year, um, you know, we're seeing a slowing with many people saying, well, it's slowing, but it's still a soft landing. I would say it's slowing and it's probably slowing into a mild recession. And I think the issue is, I know there's a, a lengthy discussion on China coming up, is that um, the slowdown um, in China is one that is structural in nature. We do think that over the next 10 years, you know, China's potential growth will go to a three handle. If you look at the IMF numbers over the next 20 years, they see it going to two and a half percent only. And there's very little in the global economy that you know, replaces China demand. So the real question on China is, can they actually do this rebalancing to private consumption, which they had laid out? And also, can they manage the financial stability risk given all of the stress that they're seeing in the property market right now, which is 20 to 25% of GDP? And here, you know, in contrast to the U.S. housing market, the China housing market looks like it's going through a double dip. And maybe, Joyce, could you just – thank you for that more in-depth observation, which hopefully could be, be some topics that come up in the next panel. Maybe could you also dig in a little bit on Europe? Just give us a sense about how you feel about the, the, the glide path of, of European economic activity. Well, I, I think that look, at the beginning of the year, there was just real relief that gas prices came down so dramatically because the um, predictions had been for you know a, a deep recession in Europe because of gas prices. And what we have seen is that, you know, it, it, in large part thanks to the U.S., that they have been able to sort of diversify, and we had thought that they would not get to sort of independence from Russian gas. When we first put out our predictions, we were saying it would be 2027. Now we think it's the middle of 2024 that Europe has really sort of weaned that dependency on Russian gas. So that was the initial surprise at the beginning of the, the year that you didn't have this recession. But now, as we look later into the year, what we have seen is um, just a, 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 you know, a, a slowdown, and particularly in Germany, if you look at the export engine and manufacturing and um, you know, the uh, and their competitiveness there, um, a, a real slowdown that is um, playing out. And where you really could see, you know, is Europe going towards a scenario that is more recession or perhaps really um, some type of stagflation scenario? is really what I think the fears are at this point in time where um, you know, they have not been able to bring you know, inflation down. Um, at the same time, you know, the um, manufacturing sector, things that have been core to Europe on the export engine you know, um, are fading as well as we do see um, just that their external competitiveness has not been able to keep pace. So this is where we are really seeing that you know, the U.S. has been the engine um, you know, this year. And the question is, with the U.S. slowing, will you see those recession risks playing out more um, in Europe and a continuing slowdown that will continue in China as well? Um, that just uh, they have seemed to have put out a very clear view that on stimulus measures, um, you know, they're not going to do something that's big bang. They're paying for the cost still of what they did during the global financial crisis with all the local government financing vehicles. Um, really facing some default risk right now. So I think those who thought they could count on China stimulus are going to be disappointed that China is not going to do more. And the Europe model is much more dependent on China. You know, it's really interesting in our analysis, we estimate that if um, China's growth comes down 1%, um, you know, it, it basically means zero to the U.S. economy now. Um, and, and that was very different before the pandemic, but we are seeing this diversification of trading partners and the supply chain play out. Well, Joyce, thank you for all that. We're, we're going to pivot right now and speak with Mark because Joyce touched upon a couple of topics that Mark's been a, an expert on. Um, Joyce mentioned the dollar reserve <clears throat> around the world. And if, if you were to, uh, of your observation with your experience, you look at the current condition of what's happening in the world is there any one thing that maybe rises to the top as to what you think is most notable? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I, I've been following the foreign exchange market for my career, and what I really like about it is that it's big. 24 hours a day, the average daily turnover in the foreign exchange market, $7.5 trillion. $7.5 trillion is really a mind-boggling number. 
put this in perspective for you, global trade in a year is about $30 trillion. Today being Thursday means that by the end of today, the foreign exchange market's done enough this week to cover world trade for a year. The world's GDP is about $100 trillion. The month is almost over. We've done that already this month alone. So for me, the foreign exchange market offers a, like a picture glass window to observe not only economics but political issues as well. And the thing that stands out in the foreign exchange market as we sit here today is the incredible strength of the dollar. I think this really builds on what Joyce was talking about, American exceptionalism. When I say the dollar is strong, what does this really mean? Well, because my, our friends in the crypto space are right, the dollar is not backed by gold or silver anymore, fiat. So what determines the value of these currencies is, is more elusive. And economists have come up with a model, a sort of explanatory model, trying to get to the valuation. And you've probably seen in The Economist magazine, purchasing power parity. A basket of international traded goods should, trade for the, should sell for the same price once you make the currency adjustment. The Economist magazine, I think, does the Big Mac or a Starbucks cappuccino to, get that, to, get to, to give you a flavor for that. So I don't, I don't have my own model for purchasing power parity. I use the OECDs, and that's the, right, that's the club, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, about 36 of the, large, of the richest countries. They have their own model for purchasing power parity. Typically, currencies, the OECD currencies don't move more than 20% away from fair value. The euro and the Japanese yen today are more than 50% undervalued, which is to say the dollar is more than 50% overvalued. This is the most it's been in my career, and my career goes back to the, about the Plaza Agreement back in 1985, when the G7 countries, or actually I think it was the G5, met at the Plaza Hotel to drive the dollar down because it was too overvalued. What I'm suggesting to you is the dollar is more overvalued today than it was then. And that, of course, has all kinds of ramifications on the economy. It, it hurts exporters. It helps importers. It also distorts, what other, uh, distorts the effect on other countries, boosts their inflation. So I would take one exception to what Joyce was saying, that, and I agree with her that there hasn't been much progress on European inflation. But I think that is coming, beginning this month and next month. And partly, I'm not a rocket scientist for this. I just know what happened last year. Last September and October, European inflation jumped by more than 1% a month. Those numbers are going to drop out of the 12-month comparison. And so we're going to be, by the, uh, by the end of November, we'll be looking at European inflation close to U.S. inflation, about 3.5% or so. So I think that the real takeaway, I think, is that the dollar is very strong now. And for U.S.-based investors, for dollar-based investors, this is a big opportunity because it means that foreign assets are cheap in dollar terms, not just the companies, earning streams, labor is cheap. And you're already beginning to see this with how Americans are behaving. That rich guy in Omaha has begun buying Japanese companies, taking advantage of the weak Japanese yen. And I think we see this in uh, some early dated flows from Americans beginning to diversify our retirement money, our 401k, buying more European and Japanese stocks maybe buying a bit less U.S. stocks. But this also, of course, has serious ramifications for corporate America, and we're going to see that beginning next month when they begin reporting their, their next quarterly earnings. We're going to see many of the companies blame uh, the, the strength of the dollar for weaker earnings growth. Wow, thank you. There was a lot there. Was that rich guy in Iowa Warren Buffett by oh, chance? Omaha, yeah. Omaha, I'm sorry, Omaha was Warren Buffett, just to make sure we're talking about the same rich same, guy. Same rich man. Okay, that's number one. Number two is if we want a cheap cup of Starbucks cappuccino, we have to get on an airplane and go somewhere. I think that's, so. that's what I think I heard you just say. <laughs> um, uh, so, and, and then also I thought that, you know, we got a little bit of advice in there too, which is I think you were saying that, and, and this is the job that you had done specifically at Brown Brothers, which is, from your view of the currency, if you were thinking about a longer term approach to an investment portfolio, you'd probably thinking now would be a good time to, to buy foreign assets. Yeah, I think that uh, to Joyce's point, the U.S. exceptionalism is rising. Sorry about that. On is up. Yep, uh, so jo Joyce was mentioning about American exceptionalism, and one form of that exceptionalism has been the uh, aggressiveness of not only monetary policy in the U.S., but fiscal policy. That's what's getting the economy going. That's why the dollar has been so strong. 
And I think that those days, my guess, I sort of agree with Joyce too. I, I think that this soft landing idea reminds me of the off the top of a building, 100 story building. And when he's on the 80th, when he's passing the 80th floor, he says, everything's okay still. He passes the 60th floor, everything's still okay. He, planes, they have landings. I don't think economies really do. And I think that uh, we should be looking, I think, be prepared for major headwinds. Uh, Joyce mentioned some of them. Uh, for me, the, uh, the UAW strike, possible government shutdown, the tightening of lending standards. Uh, the, you know, we've, uh, we've built up savings during COVID. We've, worn, we've drawn them down quite a bit now. Uh, most of the U.S. recessions since the 70s have taken place when we have a, a, an energy crisis, a spike in energy prices, often a doubling of oil. We're not quite at a doubling of oil. But the high oil prices, at first, of course, it filters through the CPI. The P so it filters through inflation, lifts inflation, obviously. And it also lifts uh, the way we report retail sales, which is on a nominal basis. So last month, retail sales were bloated by higher gasoline prices. But ultimately, higher oil prices, higher energy prices is a tax on us. It might not be a tax that the government gets, but it's a tax on us because it reduces our, dis our income to spend on other things. So the more it takes to heat our house or cool our house, depending on what part of the country we live in these days, the more it takes to fill our car with gasoline, the less money we have to buy other things. And those other thing prices soften up. And so I think that we've got some of these major headwinds coming to us. And, and as Joyce said, it looks like the economy is growing fine here in Q3. If you try to play this game at home, what I find useful is the Atlanta Fed has a GDP Now tracker. You could Google that. Uh, Atlanta Fed GDP now. And rather than doing it as an economist trying to forecast, they do it more of an accounting function, adding up the data as it comes in. And they're still looking at something above 4% growth this quarter. But I think this is a, as good as it gets. I think we're going to see a much weaker uh, Q4. And next year, uh, the Fed's forecasts uh, yesterday suggested that we get closer to 1% growth next year. 1% growth is almost stagnation, especially when you give, a, give us a population growth of about 1%. Uh, that that's all very interesting and, and also I'll tell you there's another theme that I heard in both what Joyce said and what Marcus said which is something just happened that thankfully doesn't happen very often which is we just had a hundred year pandemic and I know Joyce talked about how we've had American exceptionalism in part because of all the stimulus that came through the economy um, we, we heard that now uh, from Mark touch on that a little bit which is we really don't know exactly what happens after all this is being unwound. So I think that's what's unusual is we're going through something that typically doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we've been hit by like a lot of shocks. <clears throat> I, I think of the image of a snake eating a doe. And as, it, as the doe works through the snake's body, it takes a while. And we've been hit with shocks. The COVID, the, the pandemic itself was a shock. The policy response is another shock. The uneven response to it, China just ending zero COVID earlier this year. And then on top of that, you have the war in Ukraine. And on top of that, I think you have an, uh, an appreciation. The US, many US states, Europe, uh, Japan, all talking about getting rid of internal combustion engines in about a decade, 2035. So if I was an oil producer and I see this is what people are planning getting rid of internal combustion engines, I'm going to want to maximize the value of my oil that's still in the ground. That's my nation's wealth. And so you see OPEC and their allies trying to boost the price of oil. And I think that, that's another shock that we have to deal with. Th thank you for that. Let's, let's so, and you and I had a great chance to catch up in preparation for today. And you, you thought that there were a couple of other themes um, that were out there that would be interesting for this group to consider. One was you said, hey, look, the dollar is, is, is as rich in value as it's been in your career, which we just talked about. What would be the next notable item that you see in the world scene that you think it would be important for us to consider? I think one of them is what the, uh, what the, the World Bank, the IMF, and now the WTO is talking about, in the, a deglobalization or a fragmentation. I think the WTO said it's going to cost about 5%, 5 percentage points off of world growth. And so this is partly, I think, uh, two developments sort of forcing this issue. And I, I was teaching at the, uh, the borough of Manhattan Community College uh, before COVID struck. And my students already then were talking about deglobalization. What it presents, I think, is that what economists call import substitution strategy. 
like Okay, I, I'm sorry, maybe, I thought I was born with a megaphone in my throat, but apparently not. The, uh, the, but this fragmentation is part of this import substitution. We don't want to, we in the United States don't want to be reliant on China for pharmaceuticals. We don't want to be, they don't want to be reliant on us on semiconductors. Or com imagine this, you're in China and you're, you're held captive to two mobile operating systems, OIS and Android. It's not just in the US, I want to say all the major countries are having their own import substitution. Everybody wants to have the mRNA capability. They want to have semiconductor capability. Uh, they want to have uh, EV capability, whether it's the, e the electric vehicles themselves or the batteries or the components. And so this, I, I think we've entered a, a, an era that I think began before COVID, before the war in Ukraine. And I think it's just sort of exacerbated by these things. But this fragmentation, it, it's, it's expressed many different ways. One is, I think Joyce mentioned about moving supply chains out of China. And partly what's happening is some countries are big, res are big beneficiaries. I'd say Vietnam, for example. And you'll see this, I think what, what it means is that uh, Vietnam is going to be running larger and larger trade surpluses with the U.S. And they're going to fall in the crosshairs of the Treasury Department and other people who are anxious for it to revalue its currency or to open up its economy. Uh, partly what brings them to our radar screen is that they're going to be running large trade surpluses with the U.S. as they replace China. But also what China is doing is exporting goods to Vietnam that they can export to the U.S. without facing the tariffs that both Trump and Biden have put on China. I'd say closer to home, we, t we talk about it French shoring and near shoring. Mexico has been a huge beneficiary and will continue to be. Not only do they have cheap wages, but partly because of the NAFTA and the USMCA agreement, these free trade agreements, countries, including China, are producing goods in Mexico, exporting them to the US. So the Mexican peso has been really, uh, last year was the second strongest currency, this year it's the first or second strongest currency. Do you expect a country with a large, uh, with an appreciating currency to have trade difficulty? Mexico doesn't have trade problem. Mexico, in fact, that's one of the things that make the Mexican peso so strong and attractive. Besides that they have 11 and a quarter percent overnight interest rates, th their exports to the U.S. are record levels, despite the strength of the peso. And again, partly this is uh, the free trade agreement and partly it's the near shoring, French shoring. So if you want to build something, you want to sell something to the U.S. market, the richest consumer market in the world, what do you do? Why produce in the U.S., produce in Mexico, and export to the U.S. duty-free? So I'd say Vietnam and Mexico are among the biggest beneficiaries of this fragmentation, which you could think of as globalization but regionalized. Maybe it always was. Uh, there's like a hub in, uh, hub in Asia. Maybe it was around Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and now China has moved into there. India, Vietnam are close. Thailand, Indonesia. And also, of course, here in the Americas, we have the, uh, not only Mexico, we have also a free trade agreement with Colombia. And so uh, maybe you have these pockets. And of course, in the US, we think of Maquiadora, those first 25 miles or so into Mexico. Well, that's what Eastern Europe and Central Europe is for, for Western Europe. Uh, Hungary, Poland, the uh, Czech Republic. These are places where Germany has put production facilities. Uh, taking advantage of different issues, including cheaper labor, lighter regulation. So I think that uh, besides a strong dollar then, this fragmentation of the world is going to have winners and losers. And I think the U.S. is going to come out ahead, partly because we will have more manufacturing in the U.S. And that's really one of the strong points of the economy right now. It's under like a category called manufacturing construction. Building factories in the U.S. And now the, I should say that these factories that are being built, they're, they're just uh, sort of an ongoing process and helped with U.S. subsidies. But bringing back manufacturing in the U.S. is not the same thing as bringing back manufacturing jobs. For the U.S. to be competitive, these factories are going to be automated. We already see a lot of that happening already. And I think the BLS is estimating we're going to lose, even though we have greater, we'll have greater manufacturing capacity, we can produce more widgets, we're going to be doing it with fewer people. Wow, very insightful. Do you? So that was a great snapshot of what's happening, especially, <clears throat> and you said friend shoring. Is that friend what you, friend yes. shoring? Would I hadn't heard that it, before, very mean, interesting. Like allies. Sure, you no, it may, I, it's a great term. Um, do you think it's gonna continue? I mean, like, is this a trend that's here for a long time or is this just a moment in time? 
No, I think it's. I think it's. I think that. So for me, the story I would tell is that uh, when Bretton Woods broke down in 1971, actually we just celebrated the anniversary, August 15th, 1971. Nixon, redu Nixon removed the last link to gold, and we were lost for almost a decade. And then we had this new era brought on by Reagan and Thatcher, and that I think collapsed uh, with the great financial crisis. And I think we've been lost a little bit, and I think that uh, what's filling in that, that interregnum period has been a rise of economic nationalism and greater geopolitical rivalry. And so I think that that French shoring, near shoring, the fragmentation is partly a product of what I think is going to be this new era that lies ahead of us. Uh, which, whether it's a cold war, whether it's this uh, bipolar world, whether it's a multipolar world, I think that world that Reagan and Thatcher helped usher in is over. And that free trade era, we saw free trade grow rapidly, trade barriers get reduced. Remember, what we used to call it GATT, the General Agreement to Talk and Talk, right? Before the World Trade Organization. There would be years long negotiations to remove trade barriers. That helped create the conditions for the rise of countries like China. And I think that era is over, and now we're going to go back to a little bit more economic protectionism and trying to get, f you know, you see this in the Biden administration, not really talking about new free trade agreements so much, but trying to work on the next level. It's not so much trade. This is incredible modern modernity, huh? I almost feel like I'm at a football game. <laughs> <laughs> but this incredible, incredible uh, uh, growth in output growth in world trade, I think those, those days are over and we're, we're looking at a, a slower growing world and a, more of an aging population and I think a less free trade, a more protectionism and more regionalization of that. And, and, and I think interestingly, early in your remarks, you said deglobalization is going to slow global growth. Yeah, that's, uh, the IMF, the World, uh, the World Bank and the WTO, they've recently come out with estimates about how much it's going to slow down, but these are aggregate. What's always important is not just what happens on the aggregate level, but how those losses or gains are distributed. And I do think the U.S. will come out ahead. I think that the real losers are going to be sort of like one of those, uh, what people say about, to he who has is given. I think if you have in the Reagan-Thatcher era, you're better positioned for the next era. While those who, who suffered in the Reagan-Thatcher era, uh, whole, like huge parts of Africa, parts of internal, uh, like sort of interior of East Asia, the interior of South America, I think emerging markets suffer the most from this concentrate production. It was, how did countries develop at the end of world, from the end of World War II? Partly because U.S. multinationals would locate plant and production in those countries. And then with the uh, reducing barriers to trade, all made this all possible. And I think those are things that are going into reverse now. Okay. Um, we're going to pivot here because we have one of the market's leading experts on currency. So as a currency expert, how do you feel about cryptocurrencies? <laughs> you got your pencil out to say buy more foreign stocks. Get ready for this advice. <laughs> no, I, I, I think when I think about cryptocurrencies, I think about the moral majority. I say why the moral majority? Because they weren't moral and they weren't the majority. <laughs> and I think the same thing with crypto. The reason that we think crypto is money is because they say it is. I have the comic book in which Clark Kent, not Superman, but Clark Kent proposes to Lois Lane. When I bought it on the streets here in New York, it was about $3.50. Now it's about $50 a comic. I cannot pay my landlord with that. I cannot pay the grocer. It's not money, even if the price is appreciated, like Bitcoin has appreciated. I think there's a contradiction at the very heart of crypto. And it's really based on this economic law called Gershom's Law. And Gershom's Law basically says that bad money chases out good. So here we are with the U.S. government printing off money like it grows on trees, like other countries are. I mean, we in the U.S. didn't have negative interest rates. Negative interest rates. As we sit here today, Japan still has a negative policy rate, minus 10 basis points. Germany, the Eurozone, I should say, had negative interest rates too. Switzerland, negative, the, the gnomes of Zurich, the great bankers of the world, negative interest rates. And yet, uh, I think when it comes to crypto, we say there's a very unlikely kind of scenario, but what happens is that with this, uh, with this paper money being worth, seemingly worthless, and you have crypto, what would you spend? And what people who have crypto are doing is they're spending fiat money. They're hoarding the crypto. 
which means that the crypto doesn't get that networking advantage to really become money. What do economists think about money? They have three definitions, right? A means of transactions, a store of value, and a unit of account. Crypto doesn't meet any of those things. Then, of, cor of course, once in a while you hear about someone accepting crypto for transactions. I think Musk said that he would be willing to sell some of his Teslas for crypto. But he didn't sell a single car for crypto. And if he would, you know what he would do? He would sell that crypto right away. Because what do corporate treasures do? They're trying to manage currency risk. If you take on crypto, you're taking on a currency risk, not minimizing currency risk. You're taking on more of it. So I think that, that Gershom's law, good money, ch bad money chases out the good. If you think that crypto is good because there's a limited supply of it, then you're going to be spending your fiat money. And the crypto doesn't get that networking effect to be used as a means of transaction. I came up with a smell test to see if when crypto could be, when, when would someone like me think of crypto as money? I'd say when the IRS is willing to take it. <laughs> that is when, tax, when the tax authority is willing to take crypto, then I know it's really money. And there's been a, an experiment, I think a small town in Switzerland accepted crypto for a small part. By small part, I mean about the equivalent of about 200 US dollars worth of a tax payment. So I kind of would put that in the novelty, uh, like Musk want, willing to sell Teslas for crypto and that being the real thing. So once the IRS tells me they'll take crypto for my taxes, then I believe it's real money. Well, thank you. And, um, and we're, we're going to get to Q&A in a few minutes. But when Mark and I were chatting, um, uh, we were talking a little bit about what I do for a living. And you thought that maybe we'd try something that I don't know if it's ever been done at one of the panels, certainly that I've, I've moderated. We were going to change roles for a moment. And Mark said, Tom, remind me again of what you do. And I mentioned to him, well, I'm... CEO of a firm, I've been there for 38 years, Keith Bruett and Woods, and we're an investment bank to the financial services industry. And uh, Mark mentioned, well, there's some financial institutions and banks have been in the news recently. Maybe I'll ask you a few questions. So we're actually going to spend a few minutes uh, doing a reverse role here. Then we'll get to your Q&A. Joyce, thank you for hanging in there with us, because I, I imagine a question could come your way as well. But we'll, we'll do the moderator reversal role here for a moment. Good. So, you know, it's like, so fascinating, right, uh, thinking about the banking sector because of how important finance is in the U.S. For every dollar that a U.S. corporate will borrow from a bank, it will take two from the capital markets issuing bonds and stocks. Banks play a key role in that, even though they're not necessarily the lender. They play a key role. And so you're a, a bank expert. And so uh, it seems like there's uh, four large banks in the U.S., uh, bank one, bank two, bank three, bank four. Should there be more banks in the U.S.? Or are we over banks? How, how do you think about like, the banking industry? Well, I'll tell you, the, the, um, the future of the, of the financial services industry, uh, of which the banks are, is a big part, I think is critical. And we're also at a moment where there's change going on that I think will absolutely drive what it's going to look like in 10 and 15 years. And I think we need to be careful because I think right now the policy responses have been all about what we don't want, but policymakers are not talking about what they do want. So let, let me unpack that for a second here. So banks today are about half of financial services. One of the biggest trends that's been happening in the global economy in the United States is that non-banks are growing much faster. It was accelerated with the Dodd-Frank legislation. There's an effort underway to get risk out of the banking system. For example, in the United States, not one of the top five mortgage originators is a bank. Only three of the top ten are. So, so the drivers of mortgage, mortgage lending in the United States are non-banks. Apple the technology company has partnered with banks and is more than happy to have its customers believe that Apple may be your bank. So, there's, so the banks are really under competitive attack, while at the same time, every time there's been a crisis, the response has been much heightened regulation. Uh, and so what that's done is, when I started my career in 1986, there were 14,000 banks. Today, there are 4,700 banks in the United States. 97% of those, and by the way, 97% of any number is almost all of it. So 97% of the banks in America are under 10 billion in assets. So those are very fine community banks around the country, 
um, and they do important local things. They typically don't do sophisticated things, and they typically don't finance the middle market and up in the United States. So if they're not doing it, what are the 3% of the banks that are? Well, you have four banks that have 40% of the market share in the country, and you have about 130 banks in the middle. Those 130 banks in the middle are under tremendous pressure because the regulation that's come their way is something that is hindering their competitiveness with the bigger banks, and it's hindering their competitiveness with the non-banks. And I think what's likely to happen is if policy decisions aren't made, the middle market invest, uh, commercial banks are going to disappear and be absorbed into the bigger banks. Now, but let me, there's one more important point coming. So there are four really big banks. I think it's a really bad idea to have four big banks. We should have 15 banks that are credible, have the skill set to compete. It'll be good for the consumers. It'll spread risk around the country. But to continue to have four banks that just keep growing at a much faster pace than the rest of the industry, it's going to leave us in a position where I think we're not going to be happy in 10 years. So my view is the focus should be on this middle-sized bank and why is regulation continuing to strangle those companies where they really don't present a systemic threat to the nation? And I think they're going to be regulated into an uncompetitive position. So when you talk about non-banks, are those, uh, are those what people talk about as shadow banks? They are. I, it, shadow banking sounds a little creepy, so I've been trying to stay away from it. Because, you know, I mean, I think they're actually quite transparent. They're just not banks. And so let's let's talk about what a non-traditional financial institution is really what it is it's a lot of these alternative investment funds so um metlife metlife it's a it's a well-known american life insurance company its logo is snoopy can't get any more american than that right they wanted to reinsure life contracts that they have so they did it with a captive insurance company that's owned by general atlantic owned by a non-bank uh, general atlantic is an alternative investor they that's number one. Number two is you look at the growth of these insurance companies that are owned by these uh, alternative asset managers, it's actually been faster than the banking industry and they're buying loans from banks. Now, this is not 100% true. We're gonna say just from a compass perspective, it's a direction, but it looks to me like it might be cheaper to make loans with insurance policy premiums instead of deposits in a bank because of the regulatory cost of being a bank and other forces. So let's talk about some of those other forces. During COVID, and we were talking about the uh, policy response, typically bank deposits grow 5% a year. They grew 38% in two years during COVID. All these deposits come into the banks, they're now leaving. As they leave, Banks have a loan to deposit ratio that they like to manage to. Let's just say it's 95%. So as deposits are shrinking, they don't want to make loans because they don't have the deposits to do it. And they don't have the insured deposits to do it. So, so you've got the banking industry shrinking as the government policy and monetary policy and quantitative tightening is draining liquidity from the system. That's another pressure that's on banks right now. my deposit rate, my savings rate really went up. So of course I want to take my money out, put it into a money market fund and buy a US T bill, which the government makes very easy to buy it over the internet these days. That's it. So the, the government has emerged as a major and that but that's the that's the policy they want. They want to take liquidity out. They want Americans to be buying treasuries instead of saving. That that's the goal to slow the economy and, and drain liquidity. So that is the stated policy. So what the banks will do is they're going to have to, over time, come closer to 5%, but then they're going to have to charge 8% for a loan. So it, it'll all catch up with itself. So Tom, you, you recently testified before Congress about, the, about banks and regulation. What, what can you tell us about what you told Congress? So after, after the bank failures, um, I testified in front of a, con a committee in front of Congress. And first of all, I did cover the fact that the, the reason for the three big bank failures in the United States were really idiosyncratic. There were features about those three banks that were highly unique that I think led to their failure. In part, 
they had a majority of their deposits were uninsured deposits. And when depositors got nervous, we had a good old fashioned bank run. Just what was different about this than 2008 is they, with, with electronic banking, it happened immediately via phones and wires. You didn't see lines out in front of IndyMac and Washington Mutual like you did in 2008. So, so it, was, it was a virtual bank run. Um, and then when the government, that, that happened with Silicon Valley's failure on Friday. By Sunday, the government realized this was really bad and there might be more dominoes that might fall because confidence is critical for the banking system. So the decision was made that all the uninsured depositors in those three banks were going to be made whole as a special exemption. That stemmed the, the, the bank run. Um, so, uh, so, so I think the key takeaways are is that the banking industry is actually very sound, which is a rather dramatic comment since we just had three of the four largest bank failures in history. And, and, the, gov and the banks are still taking $100 billion from the government and the, from the Federal Reserve and the, and the new facility they came up with. So it Correct. Seems like so from the outside, it still seems like the banking sector is stressed, and especially when we think about the what that is, What I think that is, is those are banks that are somewhat stressed that are using that facility to bridge the moment. And, and the moment, by the way, is interest rate risk management could have been better. Because five and a, but, but if you, most banks, let's say, have a duration in their bond portfolio of four years. If we can make it four years, these bonds are gonna mature. All, the, all these government bonds, not risky bonds, government bonds. By, by the way, we did do an analysis of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet their mark-to-market is no different than the banking industries, and they actually make the interest rates. So if you own government bonds and interest rates went up, you lost money. And so that's part of the feature of the, of the mechanism that banks play in the economy. Um, and there are a handful of banks that have a little bit more stressed position. They're going to survive, but they're using those facilities. So, so what's the, what, as, as individuals, as consumers, what, what, do you, what would you advise us to do? Um, I, like, should we be putting our money in uh, the large, these large, the top four banks, or should we keep our? That's money a in great the question, banks? and actually, you're now getting to the number one idea I had in that testimony, which is we need FDIC deposit insurance reform. So there's a sense that banks can be too big to fail. So within a week's period of time, Credit Suisse got wobbly in Europe, and the regulators in Europe, I'll call them the invisible hand navigated Credit Suisse to their arch rival UBS. Remember, they hadn't merged in 200 years, but they did that weekend because they got some encouragement to do that. So the invisible hand makes that merger happen. Um, in the United States, when Silicon Valley failed, the FDIC said to depositors, if you have more than $250,000 in the bank, we're gonna give you a certificate and we'll let you know how much you're gonna get back on the dollar. That's what, and if you look at the testimony of the CEO of First Republic, on Thursday, he was getting deposits from Silicon Valley. On Friday, he had an all-out bank run in his bank because the FDIC made that decision. So you don't want America, I believe, picking their bank based on the size. So, so I think we need more deposit insurance coverage so Americans aren't being asked to do credit analysis on their banks, which they're probably not going to do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, so I've been working for my career, and I don't have $250,000 in my savings account or a checking account at a bank. And so I'm, I'm fine. Most people I know are well protected by the current FDIC insurance. It's, it's small business. So, for example, for a while, I was the chairman of the audit committee of my local American Red Cross chapter, volunteer job. If, and I'm sure there are volunteers like that across America, okay? And those institutions might have more than $250,000. But, but let me finish that thought. It's an unpaid volunteer job. You could leave your money in your local bank because they support the community where your charitable organization is. And if that bank had trouble, you would lose all your money and you'd probably have lots of legal responsibility for that. Or you could go to a big bank. The, the upside downside reward is such that you're gonna get you're gonna move to a big bank because you won't lose your job if 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 you're safe there and if the other bank fails, then you go to small business. So here's the deal: COVID happens. The U.S. government wants to get all these triple P loans into the market. Who do you think 
distributed those loans for the U.S. government. 55% of the funds went out in community banks. The biggest banks weren't a big enough funnel to get it out into small business. It's the mid-sized banks in America that make small business loans. So it's the small business, not, not consumer, it's the small business that needs this deposit insurance. And, and specifically, my, my reform was for, do it for checking accounts above 250 so small business can feel comfortable in mid-sized banks. Otherwise, small business is going to need to go to the big banks or use non-traditional lenders. And that's what we did, I think, during the great financial crisis. Let, let, uh, bank, let the depositors, these small, medium-sized businesses, have a uh, like non-savings account, like a non-interest-bearing account, and use that. One hundred percent. It was. It's been done before. It's a feature. And actually, the FDIC wrote a report. Some of their reports have been excellent on what to do post this spring's failures. And they said, we should have deposit insurance reform, but they need Congress to pass it, and there doesn't seem to be any interest in Congress. So, so what else could we, like, what are, from, so you're looking at the banks, uh, which is sort of like the, uh, if not the brain, the heart of the circulatory system of capital. What, 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 from your insight, what do, you, what do you see in the world, in the economy? Well, I, I think it's not the right policy statement to, I, I, I think that the, the regulation and the and if there's a, a problem at one bank, the whole industry faces criticism. I I think that the more that that banking is pushed outside of the banks, the less policymakers are going to have a window into what's happening. So whether it's monetary policy, um, the other thing is you talked about payments. One of the best things I think our government's done is they passed the Patriot Act after 9/11. The Patriot Act is a national security bill, and it has to deal with the payment system and bank secrecy and anti-money laundering. The regulators have forced the banking industry to, to focus on that, and I think they've done a really good job. If this payment system in crypto or outside of banks develops, the government's not going to have a window into that world. And, um, and I think it's going to have broad policy implications. So I, I think you do want to have a robust banking industry and not continue to focus just on, and when, again, our firm has defined banks as half of the market and half and shrinking. If, if, if you're only focused on regulating a half and shrinking piece of the market, you should probably want a better idea of what's happening in the other half that's growing. So it seems to me like banks, I don't know, my whole career has been like a series of banking crises and I haven't been involved in any of them. But the... Uh, but isn't there like something fundamental about banks? They uh, they take our deposits that we can take back anytime we want, and then they lend for the long term. So you borrow short term, lend long term. Is there like uh, our capitalist model? Are we just going to be vulnerable to these crises? Can we really avoid them, or can we just mitigate them a little bit? So I don't. The one thing now now you're going to say, Tom, is this really true? But really true? I know this is what I'm about to say is, remember we had three bank failures that were quite spectacular. But we also had 4,700 banks that didn't fail. And we also had a failure that the deposit insurance fund is going to cover 100% of the loss. The government doesn't spend a dollar. The industry itself funds this insurance fund. And it didn't really seem to be much of a ripple in the longer term view of the US economy. I actually think it's a story of resilience. I actually think, wow, that actually was pretty bad, and we're still here. And the response, it doesn't seem like, uh, like the impact of that, that, that's almost like the safety mechanism worked. I look at it differently. Yeah, so maybe, maybe it's right, but then it seems to me like, why, why don't other countries have banking crisis? I know Credit Suisse, UBS, that was sort of a unique thing in Switzerland. But we don't hear about banking crisis like in France, Germany. And we, it seems like we have serial banking crises. No, I mean, the savings well, and loan crisis early in my career, we had that oil patch in Texas, uh, turned out to be a, a, ba a little bit of a savings and loan crisis. Uh, the great financial crisis seemed to me that began with the banks, and then it was a banking crisis that turned into a, a economic crisis. It, uh, the, I, I'm just giving them a bad name. There, are, there were 29, the, the world's regulators have said that there are 29 globally systemically important banks in the world. These are the 29 that deserve special mention, special attention. Only one of them is, we won't call it a failure, but needed to be resolved, and it was in Europe, Credit Suisse. But what about Silicon Valley Bank? Wasn't they, that's too they're small. Not a, they, they were too small to be c coming into the systemic 
co coverage, but they were no, big that, enough to come under systemic risk. In the I, US. I think we probably just don't know about the regional banks and other. I mean, in 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 China right now, I know this next panel will talk about it with who owns the real estate. Uh, I I I I think m when you look at stability, I think the American banks have actually been on the global of those 29. There are very fine institutions overseas too, but they've been pretty stable. Why don't we get to Q and A because we, we're we're going to run out of time. For the microphone. The markets have been driven by these big tech companies uh, coming out with ChatGPT and AI. Uh, what is the impact uh, expected to be on uh, global economic growth? Is that just a, an investment opportunity that um, kind of results in some transition of the economic activity, or is that uh, going to have an effect on uh, well, overall growth? Well, why don't we start with that one? Why don't we give that to Mark? Uh, the and then Joyce, too. To Joyce. <laughs> you want, would you prefer? Or maybe, but, well, we'll, just, we'll start with Mark. So chat GPT impact on global growth. Yeah, huh? what an amazing thing in our lives. Huh? It's probably the big, like, like the new shiny object, right? To me, it's a, rather than a revolution, it seems like an evolution. I was using, a, I use Word, and I had a Word, Word has a, has a grammar check. And, uh, and then I began using Grammarly, which not only has a, gr has a Word check, but a grammar check, and even makes suggestions on how to improve your writing. And then it comes on ChatGPT, or something like that, the AI, some of these AIs. I've been using Bard lately, just because it goes back longer, and it gives me the sources. Uh, but uh, I, I, think it's gonna, I think that we're still in the early stages. It's going to revolutionize work. Uh, I see all kinds of enhancements of productivity. And I think that I, yeah, I, my son went to Stuyvesant High School here in New York. And I played baseball. And even so, this is about 10 years ago. And rather than having a student write the summary of a baseball game, it was automated. Computer did it. Uh, you put in a box score, you can really tell a baseball story. But it's not just them. I mean, I see a Bloomberg sometimes on Bloomberg stories now says automated. Uh, the Financial Times uses automated writers. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think this is going to change. I mean, I think it, increasingly I find that I spend almost a, a little bit of every day using that uh, for research. Uh, it improves my productivity. So I can just imagine what's going to happen five, ten years from now. Uh, sort of the next, sort of the chat GPT 5.0 or whatever it is by then, uh, that I, I can just think that, that this is going to be a revolutionizing uh, how work is done. So I, I think I'm very optimistic about it, but of course, a lot of, there's, whenever there's something good, there's always, a, there's always a, like a, uh, a cloud and a silver lining. Next question, Ken. Ken. Tom, isn't it possible that from the point of view of U.S. policy, the rise of non-banks has been a net positive because their liabilities are inherently longer dated and more stable than bank deposits because, and that means their capital, even if it's more expensive, is actually more stable. Uh, some of the best, there are excellent non-bank, if I made a judgment that it was bad, I'm not saying it's bad, it just ought to be deliberate, I think would be my point. Um, the, the question was, what about the non-bank competitors? There are some excellent companies uh, in that space um, and we should just, as a, as a policy makers consider this, they should just know it's underway, and if it is, just know we manage it. But there have also been other parts of it. So I think one of the most uh, notable items of this past year was the FTX bankruptcy, um, which was not an American domiciled institution. But what I think we learned is that there was a commingling of funds and other activities that that firm was doing that's generally been outlawed in the American securities industry since the 1930s. Um, and, and Congress hasn't addressed that yet. Um, I'm sure it will get to that, but, but there will be parts of it that will need to be managed. And then the idea about the Bank Secrecy Act that I mentioned, you, you would probably just want a level playing field on some of these other variables. I, I didn't mean that non-bank lenders are bad, they're not. Some of them are really good institutions. You look at the mortgage industry, part of the reason why they've taken so much share is they're really good at it. So, um, so that was not the determination. Uh, Tom, this is for you. Uh, your firm knows the regional banks intimately. Um, you know, today, Treasury, 10-year Treasury is at 4.47, uh, I believe. L last time I checked, yesterday the Fed came out and said, Interest rates are going to be higher for longer. 
What do you think that does to the to the regional banks, uh, given deposit outflows, mark to market issues? Um, are we at risk for another blow up? Are we, or is this going to be a consolidation type? Um, I I don't I don't think it'll be a blow up because the industry still has outstanding capital, um, and the industry also has been put on notice over the last six to nine months, and I would say is very focused more on the balance sheet than income statements. The question just was about the health of regional banks. Um, so I think they'll be able to manage this moment, but they're going to manage it with less profitability. Um, and I would say the driver of that is that it's a little bit about what Mark said earlier, is over time their cost of funds is going to get closer to the market rate. Uh, and that's going to grind down profits uh, for these companies. So they'll be a little bit less profitable while this shift I is occurring. And then, the, and then if we get the outlook that Joyce talked about earlier, which is a mild recession, so we don't have to talk about credit costs, um, that would be very favorable. But I, but I think we're in line for the, ba the banking industry is still right-sizing its size relative to what the new level of deposits is, as deposits leave banks and go to treasuries. And then they're, they're adjusting to the new level of interest rates, uh, uh, and that period is still ongoing, and I think you'll continue to see declining return on capital as a measure of profitability, but it will still be healthy and stable. Can you just maybe say something about the uh, commercial real estate? We read a lot about how regional banks did a lot of <coughs> commercial lending, and a lot of those commercial real estate loans are coming due 24, 20, 20, 20, 24, 2025. Is this something that uh, along those kind of lines should be... Is this something that we should be careful of? for Yeah, so commercial real estate. So I, we have a team at KBW that studies the commercial real estate market. Um, and uh, we believe that certain markets in the country, and by that we mean typically the coastal markets, and we mean in the cities, are probably likely to see as much as 35% decline from the peak on the value of, of these commercial real estate properties. And I would say half of that move is just because cap rates have moved higher in the internal valuation models. And then the second is this new world of occupancy and the, and the fact that uh, class A space is in so much higher demand than B and C space. So typically, the regional banks aren't the biggest lenders in those markets. It'd be the bigger banks or it'd be the non-bank lenders. Um, but regional banks do have uh, have commercial real estate around the country. Um, we've spent a lot of time with the regional banks. What you'll find is a typical commercial real estate loan for some of those banks might be $2 million, and it might be in markets where everybody's gone back to the office or their medical office buildings. We would expect more losses, but it'll be more severe in cities like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, on the coast, in our, and even in Washington, D.C., in, in our analyst's opinion. Uh, actually, at the table back there, that, that, that gentlewoman. Is it me? Oh, okay. We'll go one, two, both of you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, this, this question is actually for Joyce, and I'm just wondering about, in your forecasting, how does climate change pressures from that um, figure into your accounting of the soft landing predictions? And where does thank that you. fit? No, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, look, when we take a look at the um, costs for climate investment, you know, 1.4 trillion a year, this really does feed into our scenario that we are in a period of regime change. We're looking at higher inflation, higher fiscal deficits. Look, I think the big fear in the U.S. is actually they're not going to cut the fiscal spending. We see basically the size deficit continuing until 2026, and the revenues have been dropping. So the implications for this are you know, shorter cycles. Like if we used to think about an expansion and a recession as 10 years, I would cut that in half, and we're very late cycle right now. But higher deficits, higher yields, and higher inflation um, that are here to stay. And maybe I can just add a, a couple of points on some of the um, questions that had come up. You know, I fully agree with Mark that Japan is very interesting right now. They are truly going through regime change as they go to positive inflation um, and also um, it, you know, abandoned YCC, yield curve control, um, and I think abandoned negative real interest rates. So that has been the top recommendation, whereas we're still quite concerned about Europe. 
Um, on the regional banks, regional banks lend about 38% of lending, 500 billion a year. Um, and everybody thought, well, you know, look, that amount of lending, if you stop, um, it's, it's, it's going to have much more of an impact on the economy. But what we've seen is that private credit has really picked up a lot of the slack. We've had 350 billion of sort of dry powder there where the private debt markets um, have been open. But I did want to add to the risks that we're watching and pick up on some of Mark's points is that we, we are looking at higher oil prices. Um, if you if oil prices are 30% higher than they were in the second quarter, they will be, if you go to 120, um, you know, basically in two quarters, you stop the expansion in the U.S. Um, and I'd say that 75% of the higher oil prices is, um, is from these supply considerations. It's not from the demand factors. So, and it goes back to the geopolitics. Thank you, Joyce. We had another question from the same table. Hi, I'm Joy. I'm Professor Osler's student through the GP program. Um, so we've talked a lot today about American exceptionalism. And in my research um, through my major global studies, I've come across a lot of um, scholar uh, scholarship uh, discussions, scholar dis scholarly discussions on um, the decline of the American hegemony. So a factor that I've seen that comes into that is talk about uh, the U.S. dollar and the strength of it, as Mark discussed earlier. So I was wondering, when we talk about the U.S. dollar and you say it's ba is backed by fiat, right? And this faith that we have in the dollar, how do you think that um, this idea of a decline of the American hegemony will affect the U.S. dollar? I'm thinking in a more cultural sense of it. How much weight do you think that the beliefs and the ideas of people weigh on the economy in a practical manifestation? Mark, would you like to handle that? I wish I could. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, I, I sort of think of it like this, that uh, it's one thing to recognize the uh, problems the U.S. economy has, uh, debt levels, uh, whatever social issues. Uh, but then, it's, for me, it's always a, a sort of a practical question of what's the alternative. And I think that behind the U.S. dollar, it's not, when foreign central banks hold dollars, they don't just hold dollars. They hold treasuries or agency bonds. And I don't think there's a market that is as big or as deep as the U.S. treasury market. Uh, if you think about the Chinese economy is really big, but their, bond, their national bond market is relatively small. I think when the, you know, when the U.S. government, uh, the Treasury has these, they sell bonds or notes almost every day of the week. And when they do, say, an average size might be about $40 billion. So for the large pools of capital, those central banks that are managing the reserves or sovereign wealth funds or large banks or insurance companies who are buying fixed income, these other, these other bond markets are, are really small. And so the, I think that, uh, for me, that's what stands behind the dollar. And I, I know there's a lot of talk about the de-dollarization. It's partly the de-globalization, the other sort of side of that coin, de-dollarization. And I'd say it's, it still seems to me to be largely in the talking phase. It is true that transaction, there's been a lot of technological progress with payment systems. So right now, if, the, if Australia sells iron ore to China, they might charge and price their good in U.S. dollars. Going forward, that might not be the case. Uh, you see this in India, for example, but to me the real telling story why I don't really believe a global south is there yet, two big reasons. One, if we talk about the uh, UN week, the Security Council, two countries want to join the Security Council right now, uh, uh, India and Brazil. China and Russia are stopping them. Now we haven't known what's going to happen if it really comes up to a vote, but they're sort of blocking this. It, it tells you a lot about how unified the global south is, which is also tells me, like, why there still is a, the head of the World Bank is an American, and the head, of, even if he's, uh, nat I mean, native-born American, regardless of their ethnicity, and why the head of the IMF is from Europe. It's not just because of hegemony, but I think it's because this global south doesn't really exist. They don't agree. We talk about global south like it's a, it's a singular noun, but it's not. And so, uh, to me, the, one of the reasons why the dollar is still going to be here uh, five years from now or whatever is that there's simply not a compelling alternative. 
I think of it like uh, we all use the same typewriter, right? Q, uh, QW, right? Uh, what is it? QW, uh, ERT, we had that QWERTY. And uh, someone tells me that there's a better keyboard out there, better ergonomically designed. You don't have to move your fingers as much. But we're not going to use it. Right? The same thing with, uh, uh, what's that called? That, that language that they come up with a few years ago, uh, Esperanto. Right? You can't fo force these things. These things have to be like organic. And I think that Europe is not ready to take on that role of leadership. Uh, and I think China is still light years away from it as well. So I think that for good or for bad, I think we have this dollar, uh, partly because of some of the strengths of the U.S. Treasury market and partly because it's just not a compelling alternative. I think um, we, we've run a little bit over our time, but we started a little bit late. Um, but I'd like to uh, thank, first of all, our panelists. I'd like to thank Joyce for being with us. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark, and I'd like to thank the staff of the FPA for organizing today, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. So thank you. Thank you.